We're going to continue with our question and answer series. So let's go ahead and begin. So I know that there's a lot of people have a lot of questions about TRV, what it is, how it works. So go ahead. All right. Here we go. What does TRV stand for and how did it come about? Well, TRV stands for Technical Remote Viewing. Back in the 80s during the Cold War, there was uh, a desire on the part of the Soviet Union at the time to hire and train psychics to be able to uh, use it as an intelligence tool to peer into finding our missile sites. Ooh. And that was in the mid to early 80s. And we found out about their program. And they, I guess they recruited somewhere around 2 million psychics and tested them or were looking for people that had you know certain capabilities. So we said, well, we've got to compete with that. So what we did was we hired one of the world's top physicists, a guy by the name of Hal Putoff, and put a program together at Stanford, funded it with $20 million. And what happened was they uh, zeroed in on how to train anyone to be able to not just be psychic, but to be able to gather information anywhere in space or time and collect information about ideas, people, and places. And at the time, it, they used a thing called coordinate remote viewing. And all they did was it was a very crude system back then. It was called, called CRV, or for coordinate remote viewing. And later on, when SciTech was created, SciTech actually was created out of the military unit. Because what happened was uh, around in 89, uh, congressional funding was lost, and they didn't want to lose this very important technology. So one of the, uh, one of the officers and, one of, and the, the general who ran the program, Albert Stubblebine, who's a four-star general, uh, took the program out and created a company called SciTech. And so that's kind of, that's a very short version of a very long history. And some of the first projects they were doing were finding kidnapped soldiers, wow. using remote viewing to um, assess, you know, various military targets. Um, and so it was, you know, it was pretty successful even back then, as crude as it was. And this is in the late 80s. And of course, then when the program kind of went underwater and it became privatized and at, at the risk of these guys going to Leavenworth because this was a highly coveted huh? top secret program. It then became public in about 95 because SciTech came out with a book called Sci Spies. And because of that book that was about to come out and kind of blow the lid off of this top secret program, the CIA contacted Nightline and they decided to do a program which was kind of a, really a disinformation campaign. What their real goal was, was to actually make the public think that it didn't work. But it does. Yeah, it does. So, so that's kind of like the, the kind of the history of it. So SciTech, the legacy of SciTech, which is, by the way, that's what our training system is. And, you know, we are SciTech. You know, that's our, our sister, the sister company of Zygon. First of all, everybody who's out there right now who claims to be a remote viewer and all the people that train so-called remote viewers, every single one of them came from SciTech. Really? Yeah. So it was all, they might have their bastardized versions of what they consider to be the training, but the actual original military protocols that were developed back in the late 80s and early 90s and then refined by SciTech and additional uh, stages were added to the to the system or additional protocols, um, it all started it all started with SciTech. So a lot of people don't realize that, but that's that's really kind of a very, very brief history. And there's all kinds of stuff online. There's a lot of it that's not true. Uh, but the core truth is, and you can go to the, web, go to the SciTech website, we have some of that information up there, uh, which is SciTech.net, P-S-I-T-E-C-H.net, and people can find out more about it. Why was this such a significant breakthrough? Well, I think the big, the really the big deal was the fact that unlike the Soviets program, is that we discover that every single human being has this capability, every one of us. So we're born with it. It's a natural gift, this sixth sense or this, uh, we call it, a, we actually call it the psi apparatus. Mm -hmm. And it's like a muscle that can be trained. And so I think that was the breakthrough. The big breakthrough was the re realization that every single human being has this innate ability and it's a reflex. 
that can be trained and tweaked. And, you know, it's not easy to train. I mean, it takes a person a while to be able right. to do this. But once they're trained to do that, they're, you know, they're never the same again. So is this different than being a psychic? Uh, it is different than being a psychic in a way. So the information source is the same place. So we call it downloading information or intelligence. Um, so that essence is, that's the same, meaning the information source. And in the old days, they called it the Akashic Records. We call it the collective unconscious or the term that Ingo Swan came up with, who was the developer of this, is called the Matrix. And by, by the way, the, the term the Matrix was before, way before the movies. I think the movies took it from us. Really? So, so kind of, so to answer your question is that this is a skill. It's not, it's, it's a skill that's trainable. Let's put it that way. So a psychic, it might have downloads or might have information that comes to them. It might be images or precognition or things of that nature, but they can't control it. So the difference between TRV and a natural psychic is a T, a TRV -er, it's a systematic controlled response. So information on demand. It's a completely different thing than, than the way a psychic operates. So a psychic could be hit or miss. And what I sometimes tell people is, and we've trained about 20,000 people around the world, which is a, which is a fair number because this is kind of a small niche. This isn't something that everybody wants to do. And it's, it takes a lot of work. So it's like, it's like going to college. So it's not like something you can just do on a weekend. You have to practice. You have to work with it. And we can actually do a training, an intense in person training in about five days. We can do an online training, which takes a little bit longer, but the person has to, it, it takes about six weeks to install the reflex. So it's, we, we call it a reflex because it's, it's like riding a bicycle or learning a martial art or swimming is it, it's, it's, it's a reflex that the body learns. And then once you've learned it, it's like riding a bike. It That's becomes, interesting. It comes like that, but mm -hmm. it takes, but it'll, it, it can take about six weeks to install it, but it takes about a year a, a practice of training because you're training your mind to grab information, to grab these gestalts. Uh, and it's a, so it can be pretty intense. Is it difficult to learn? I've trained thousands and thousands of people. There's not a single person that can't do it other than as long as they're willing to follow the protocol. So, uh, the, the, the six week training or whatever you want to call it, if they follow the training, they will be able to do this. Now there's different skill level. This is a skill. Mm -hmm. This isn't some like magical power. We all have this. It's a skill. So it does take um, a willingness to like put in the time. So they have to practice every day. No, not every day, but maybe four times a week, five times a week. For an hour, two hours? Well, or? yeah, to do a session is generally a, a full session takes 45 minutes. And you take one or two breaks during that 45 minute period of time. And what's your, and so when we first start out with the training, um, we have all the targets are blind. So all the remote viewer gets are eight numbers. Numbers, which we call target reference numbers or TRNs, are associated with the target that's inside that envelope. So whatever the, the target cue happens to be, and it could be a picture of an event, it could be a person, could be, could be literally anything, is that then they are, they go through this very rigid set of protocols. And it's not like laying back, you know, like people think and, you know, I'm, a, I'm a psychic and I'm pulling down information on the universe. It's not like that at all. It's, it looks like more like you're solving a math problem. So it's very, very intense. It's very, very rigid. And, uh, so you're telling me right now that you can put eight numbers, TRNs, you put eight numbers up and you can have a blind target of, say, Statue of Liberty. And you can find out what that is. We can actually draw the Statue of Liberty and get information about what's happening at that target site. We call it a target site. So that's yes. amazing. So in, in fact, actually what we do is so we have remote viewers all over the world. So what we can do is we actually give them that those TRNs. So it might be a number like four, five, seven, nine, six, three, eight, two. Okay. And, and that's it. They just have that, that they have those, that set of numbers and they give us back copious amounts of data about that particular target. The key to this whole thing, the key to remote viewing, is to be able to control imagination. Because imagination is what psychics have a problem with. And so, and so it's usually that first impression. And so imagination is what, and we call it AOL or analytical overlay. And as soon as a remote viewer detects, imagination has 
entered or creeped into the process, they immediately declare it, put their pen down, and then move on to the to the next thing. So those that that becomes a pile of what we call suspect data. And it may or may not be useful. It could be matching, so it could be useful. But after a time, a remote viewer is trained to detect the difference between AOL and real data. So you talk about the matrix and pulling down information from the matrix. How does that work? Well, it's a good question. That's a whole training exercise. Uh, but imagine there's this library in the universe. Again, they used to be called, you know, New Age people called it the Akashic Records or people, Carl Jung nicknamed it or called it the Collective Unconscious. It's like a repository of information. So everything that has ever been or ever will be is in this place. And even though the future is kind of a tricky piece of business, and that's why we call when we pull down information from the future, we call it a trajectory because it may or may not come to be. There's some things that are absolute. There really are destinies and the people have destinies. That's what we've discovered and learned. And they don't even know it. Yeah, yeah, they may they probably don't know it. And then but but we call them trajectories. So when we pull down information from the matrix, um some of this information is these future probabilities that we can identify. So let, let's just, I'll give you an example. So this is we're going into some application stuff here. But let's just say Somebody wants to find out what their optimum trajectory career is or optimum trajectory place they should live or things of that nature. We can do that. And so an optimum trajectory is really what is the best possible future scenario for you or for that situation or for whatever that target happens to be. Can you give us an example of that? Well, I want to know what my purpose in life is. What's my best, the best thing I should do, that my destiny or my or my best career, or who am I? What what should I be doing? Right. What's my optimum? So we we get that a lot, and so everyone see everyone has a current trajectory. That's a trajectory that they're on right now, and everyone has an an optimum trajectory. You know, something that should be optimum. And when I say optimum, does that mean money? Could be, could be. But what it really means is personal satisfaction, and generally that in, that involves wealth, or at least being well off enough. And so, yeah, so we do, and we give them, they get a report, and this report then gives them clues and, and ways to go, and some of it could be real, very bizarre stuff. Like, for example, we have one guy that his optimum trajectory was to go to the beach and convert sea salt into a business. What? Yeah, kind of bizarre. It was kind of a bizarre thing. And so um, once he got his data set, he immediately went down, he started a company, Um <laughs> Uh, mining basically sea salt and turned it into a business and it was turned into a multi-million dollar business that's now on the shelves in every grocery store around the United States. So, so yeah, things like that. It's, it might seem like bizarre at first, but oftentimes these are the clues that if we follow them, it, it can lead to like a, a whole different, you know, pursuit of happiness. That's incredible that this guy would follow sea salt. Well, he was, you know, was he, he had reached a point in his career that he wasn't happy or, you know, with what he was doing. And he said, okay, why not? And so as he started researching it, it just, it turned out to be, you know, the perfect business for him. He made millions of dollars and, and was happy with it and enjoyed and had a fulfilled life. So hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases similar to that. A lot of people, when they first learn, their interest is monetary. Generally, mm -hmm. so I want to I want to learn how to sports bet, and I want to get all I want I want to do NFL or I want to do basketball or I want to you know, I want to learn a sports bet, and we do that, and we we teach that, and it's highly highly effective, we, you know, and or stocks, or let's say something like that, mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that, there's nothing wrong with making money, um, and so let's say you know people come to us and say, can I predict the stock market? And the answer is yes, you can, uh, but it's it's a little trickier than that in that. You need a catalyst. So the target, so just saying, well, the stock market will go up tomorrow or will go down tomorrow. That's, you know, that's such a general thing. Right. But let's say IBM is doing its earnings report or Microsoft is doing its earnings report and you know that there's something big going on behind the scenes. We can actually cue a target and in advance of them don't, doing their earnings report, know whether or not the stock is going to go up or down based upon their earnings report and nail it and nail it most, most of the time. So that's How often? 80% of the time? Well, actually, all remote viewers, they're trained 
where their data sets have to be 85% accurate. So it's pretty significant. Yeah. Those that are very, very good or highly skilled and you create it, we have a team and, and the, so the data is corroborated, we can cl get close to 100%. So what's the future of remote viewing technology? We're constantly enhancing it. We're constantly adding to the, to the development of, the, of new protocols and new ways and nuances to do it. And the real future of this technology is the realization that the human, the human mind is the final frontier. This is the area of, of real exploration. And the future is that we're going to be able to develop this psi apparatus in human beings so hum people will become Jedi Knight-like. Because what this okay. tends to do is, in addition to tweaking the, uh, the psi apparatus, all these other um, sixth sense functions like telepathy or you know, precognition without even having to do, to do a target or things like psychokinesis are, are enhanced and they're more doable. So the future I see is that, is that future generations, children of remote viewers, children's children of remote viewers, people that have been, you know, their, their psi apparatus is tweaked. Um, they'll have, you know, superhuman like capabilities. Amazing. So how can Zygon members get this training? Zygon members will be able to access both beginner and advanced training and be able to just from their app. Most people, when they do this, once they realize they can do it and they realize this is for real, this isn't, you know, some made up stuff, they're blown away. Yeah. So if you want to be a professional remote viewer, actually earn a living from it, there's a way to do that. There's a pathway to do that, but you have to be willing to invest a couple of years of your, of your time. Um, you know, to be able to do that.